Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, worship team, musicians, voices, congregation of the saints. Thank you. You've gotten warmed up. You sound even better than you did Monday. Amen. Oh, wait a minute. It's a whole different crowd. Praise the Lord. Just kidding. I'm so thankful that you took the time to be here. To be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm so glad. Because you give God the glory just in your presence to say, God, I'm here for you. Oftentimes we show it because of what we might get. We are here for the God of glory. And we resound and we echo the praises of all those songs from the word, from what the Spirit of God is showing us and, and telling us it is. Jesus Christ, whom we love the most. Jesus Christ, who saved our souls. Jesus Christ, who truly is our Savior, our Lord. And he is the chief shepherd. He shepherds this church, in case you didn't know that. Thank you so very much, everyone, for being part of our our last four days, they've been incredible three days, and this is our fourth, of course. Thank you, Maddox, for uh, just speaking your heart and talking about how God is at work in your life. Thank you, of course. Uh, goodness. Jose, please stand so we can say thank you for you being here. <laughs> David, please stand so we can say thank you. Thank you for being with us. And, of course, Maddox, thank you. You guys have just truly been a blessing to us, and we thank you for sacrificing. We thank your families. Please pass on to them once again, as I have said in private, but I say publicly, thank you to your wives and your children for sacrificing you to be away. Uh, in Jose's case, I'm sure that Pei is very thankful that you were away for a few days. No, 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 but I'm so glad that you could be here. You have truly blessed us in so many ways. We hope that we have been a blessing to you. And of course, tonight, uh, we uh, get a chance to hear from Pastor Julio Contreras one more time. So very thankful. Please come. Before I say anything else, uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you on behalf of Jose and, uh, and David, Chief, and myself. Uh, we've been blessed by all of you, your, your love and your, and your just your, your smiles and your hugs and your food. And, and, and thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I just got a text from my wife. And she asked me to say thank you on her behalf. So thank you from her and from Pei and from uh, Carolina, from Carito, which I call her Chifita, you know, Chifa. Uh, so thank, thank you, thank you. And I'm, I want to say thank you also on behalf of uh, uh, guys that you might not know. Uh, thank you on behalf of Alex. He's in Colombia. And... Uh, and uh, on behalf of Mario in uh, Mexico. Has Mario ever been here? Yeah. yeah, okay, Mario. And Nelson, of course, you guys know Nelson. Uh, thank you on behalf of uh, Javier, who's in Mexico, too. On behalf of uh, Rodrigo, I know he's never been here. He's in Nicaragua. Uh, thank you on behalf of uh, Edwin, Edwin in San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, all of the pastors in, in San Salvador, there's a lot of pastors in San Salvador. I'm not going to mention them all because there's a bunch of them. But, but in Steve, I mentioned Steve the other day. Uh, he's, he's like a brother to me in many ways. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are a blessing to the kingdom. And I encourage you to, to keep on being like what you've been doing for a long time. But actually, I encourage you to keep on trying to be better. Uh, because that's the key, the key. The, you know the key to Christian life. The key to Christian life is that there is not a key to Christian life. <laughs> Everything is important. There is not one thing that is key. You, you, know, you know how people say, oh, the key to Christian life is prayer. No, 
Prayer is important, but it's not the key. Bible study is important, but it's not the key. You know, worship is important, but it's not the key. Evangelism is important, but it's not the key. You know what the key is? Everything is important. God's glory. That might be the only key. Jesus. Jesus' glory. So, I want to do something different tonight. Uh, I want to review what we've seen. I think that's, that's what we should do. Uh, a missions conference is an excellent time for God to turn on his light on us. I think that's what, what God has done the last few days. I, th I think that's what God does every time, actually every time we come to church. He turns his lights on. In a missions conference, he turns his lights on missions, on the church. In this last two or three days, he turned his light on this church as a body. You know, we've talked about this church as a body. In other times, uh, he's talked about individuals, uh, calling, maybe calling you as a, as a missionary or be more involved in missions, going to an, a missions trip. But the last two or three days, he's been talking to the whole church as a body, how we should be a body, you know, we should all get together, band together, become a, a better body for the kingdom. That's why he made us look at the Church of Antioch. Church of Antioch is, is, is a different kind of church. It's a special kind of church. And, and Chief taught us about that on Sunday. He taught you on Sunday, but I already watched the message. So he taught me too. He turned the light on Antioch. He taught us about diversity and unanimity. We have light now on that. How it is a, it is a contrast, but it's also a complement. Uh, togetherness and separation. Flexibility and strategy. Now we cannot say that we don't understand. We have light on that. We might have not understood that before Sunday, but we have light now. We understand now that we need to be a different kind of church. We might not like it, but we have light on that. Now we have light on having a door that is open. You remember uh, Acts chapter 13? We went on down how they went to meet uh, uh, Sergius Paul Paulus, uh, that guy that had all this, all this uh, uh, influence. And how he was eager to meet God, to meet Jesus. And the, the door was open. Remember how that guy had, this other guy was in opposition of the gospel trying to reach. Uh, the, the guy who was trying to be converted. And he was trying to stop him from being converted. And we, we learned that there's going to be opposition. If we want to become a, a church that is going to follow God's guidance, we're going to have to find opposition. And we had Light on that. Now the light is on. We're going to find opposition. And also we found that when we follow God's guidance, we're going to find out about our, our weaknesses. There's some of us that are like John, like John Mark. We're not ready. And that's okay. That's okay as far as we understand that those are stages in life. Uh, we, we were rushing on Monday night, and I wasn't able to finish my thoughts on that. But if you recall, John Mark deserted on Paul when, uh, when he found out all the mess he was getting into. But later on, Paul himself is gracious. He goes to a gracious restoration, understanding that John Mark wasn't ready, quite ready when he took him uh, on, on that missionary trip. And we should be like that. We should, we should have a gracious spirit with those that are not ready. You know, we, we should be a church like that. So God shine, shone, shone his light on us. The, the light is on. We, we should understand that the light is on, on bunkers and bridges. We should not build a bunker. 
we should build a bridge. We have a light that the church should not be a bunker. You know, if, if we keep a bunker now, if we decide for this church to be a bunker, uh, we're going against the light. Maybe last week it was okay because the light wasn't on. Now it's not, no, it's not okay. Maybe last week if we didn't have the idea that we should bri- build a bridge, was okay. But now the light is on. It shouldn't be okay because God turned the light on. That's the way it works. Our light is on, on how a church as unique as Antioch is not easy to build because the cost is too high. We learned that last night. We learned last night, and the light is on, about how we need to have clarity. How Solomon, when he was building the temple, the house of God, and we saw that as a picture of how we should build a church. We, we learned that the the temple in the Old Testament is a picture of the house of God in the New Testament, the, the, the local church. And we learned that we need to have the clarity. How, how Solomon said, oh, I have decided to build a house for God with clarity. He was very clear in his thoughts. And he said, I'm going to be committed. And he puts all this amount, unbelievable amount of resources Time, he, he dedicated his talents, he allocated all this, all this, uh, all, all this treasures, you know, this money, amount of unbelievable amount of money, because he understood that it took commitment. So the light is on now. The light is on that we are only going to do that if we have the necessary convictions. You remember what he said? He said, I do this because, I mean, this is for God's glory. And if I, if I don't build this, I mean, I mean, this is for God. You, you, you recall what we, we learned last night? He said, I'm building the biggest, the biggest building ever built in Israel's history, the, 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 the richest The most expensive, luxurious building ever built. And and I can't even start trying to fulfill God's glory with it. Not even my best can even try to accomplish what God deserves. Because God's glory is the very best. So that should be a conviction. So the light is on, on that. So God... Has, has turned the light on. That, that's what's happened the last few days. The light is on about clarity, commitment, convictions. We learned last night that the light is on about living on a hamster's wheel. Some of us went last night, and um, we didn't go to our wheel, but we, we went to our bed. But we got up this morning and went to our wheel, although the light is on. So the question is, what are we going to do with the light that God has turned on? That's the question. Uh, and, and watch out. Watch out. Because what I want to do tonight, and I'm going to, I, I might be shorter tonight. I don't know. I don't prom- I'm not promising, but I might be shorter. Preachers lie when it comes to time, okay? Uh, that is also... Brownie's testimony, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I might be shorter. I would like to share with you two principles. 
these two principles should apply to every time you come to church. Because every time you come to church, or every time you open your Bible, or you go to a Bible study, or uh, you have your devotional, the light should be on. God is turning the light on. But I'm afraid that very often we turn the light on, or God turns the light on, and we don't do anything about it. We, we use God's light like a Christmas light. You know, Christmas light is, is for decoration, but not for illumination, if you know what I mean, you know. It looks nice, but you, you don't use it to illuminate your, your, your living room. You don't use it to wreath. You just use it, use it to look nice. Okay, I think that should change. And, and I would like to share with you a couple of principles, very easy principles. But before I say that, before I teach you those two principles, very simple principles. Um, let me share with you something that's happened to, I'm going to say to Patty and me, because that's, that's, that's something we do together. We, the, last, the last 30 some years, we've done a lot of counseling together. Uh, we do a lot of uh, couples. We do a lot of marriage uh, counseling together, both Premarital counseling, I, to, I, I told somebody the other day that we do a lot of counseling, pre, premarital counseling. Our uh, people in our church get married a lot, a lot. I mean, uh, I usually do like 20 or 25 weddings a year, at least, at least. And I'm not the only one who, who marries, uh, uh, who does uh, marriages. I've done over 600 weddings, uh, I mean, my whole life, yeah. And, and... Uh, and it's, it is a blessing. It's a blessing. And most, most marriages stay together. Most marriages. I, I'm going to say probably 90%, that's, which is a blessing, a blessing. Uh, some don't, but, you know, you know how it is. Uh, but through the years, some of those marriages come back. They come back with a problem. And, and we sit and we talk and we listen. You know, the very first hour is usually an hour of listening and listening and listening. We listen and we listen and we listen and we listen. And then we try to open the Bible and share the Bible's advice. So we try to turn the light on. That's what we try to do. Okay. And we've seen, we've identified four answers. Four answers. And let me go fast with you. Answer number one. One, there are those who seek comfort but are not really interested in listening to advice. There are some people who want to feel like, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through that. You know, they want to be pet, you know, but they don't want to, they don't want to look, they don't want to hear advice. They don't want to hear something about changing. There's people here tonight that they would like for God to pet them, but they don't want to listen to advice. The light shouldn't change them. Just beware. Watch out. Number two, there are those who seek advice as long as it does not mean making changes that are uncomfortable for them. Okay, give me change, but not too much. You know. If it's cosmetic change, okay. But if you ask me to forgive, no. No, 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 no big changes, please. You know. Number three, there are those who wait too long to seek advice or who, out of shame, are not honest with their counselor. You know, and, and I always thought these are the worst. The worst. It's like going to a doctor. You, know, you go to a doctor, and it's like you have a, you have a strong 
you know, something hurts, you know, and it's like the doctor says, how are you doing? You have strong, strong, you know, pain, and you, and you say, oh, I'm okay. <laughs> are you really okay? Yeah, yes, yes. Why do you tell the doctor that there's something wrong with your, you know, your lung, your coughing blood or something? Oh, because I'm ashamed. But there's people like that when it comes to, your, you know, the, the problems, scenes or something that need to change. Uh, when it comes to facing what you have to change, there's people like that. And number four, there are those who seek advice and are willing to follow it, seeking God to achieve it. Okay, I wish and I hope everyone here is number four. You want to change. You want to change. Okay. If you want to change, if, we, if you want to change, if you, if you say, yes, I am number four. I want, I'm going to go over the whole thing. Okay. A basic truth of your growth process. You decide what reaction you will have to the information you have received. The light is on. You decide what you're going to do with it. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. That's where we're going to be at. Missions conferences are unbelievable. You know how it is. Missions conference allows you to see the light, but it's not magical. That's the way it is. So I'm going to try to answer the question. What steps do you follow when you know God's truth about your life? What steps should this church follow? You know what, with what we've learned the last three days. What should we do? And it's just two steps. Very easy. Two steps. Two steps. Number one, you have to make decisions. That's number one. Uh, before we go into Deuteronomy 11. What is Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is the book written by, by Moses right before they go into the land of uh, Israel. If you recall uh, Israel's history, uh, God allowed Israel to be developed in Egypt. 430 years they were hosted, well, 30 years they were hosted, and then 400 years they were slaves in Israel. They get developed. 430 years, and uh, finally, Moses, God through Moses, frees them. And they go through, through 10, ten uh, plagues, they are liberated, and they, they didn't believe God. So God says, all of you are going to die. But those who are under 20 years old. But those who are over 20 years old are going to die in the wilderness. He had already given them the law. But those over 20 years old died in the next 39 years. So what happens after four years? He says, you're going to enter the land. But I need to give you the law the second time. Because almost the whole, the whole people of Israel haven't heard the law because they all died. So Deuteronomy is the second time they hear the law. That's why it's called Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deutero, Deutero means second. Nomi is law. Second time they hear the law. So what you're going to have in Deuteronomy is a repetition of the law. And in this repetition of the law is once again... The presentation of God's idea. God is going to turn the light on once again. And he's going to say, I'm going to present you with my desire for you. And you need to make a decision. And he gives Israel, Moses gives Israel three discourses, three speeches, three lectures. The whole book of Deuteronomy, you can split it into three. 
three big chunks of truth with God's ideas. In Deuteronomy 11, God says in verse 26, he says, behold, behold. And, and I could, I, I would believe this is what he's to, telling us every time to us. He says, behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. So it's very easy, he says. He says, I have turned the light on. You know, I have presented you. And, and I, I give you two choices. You have to make a decision. I give you a blessing and I give you an occur. I give you a curse. I give you two options. You can decide to obey or you can decide to disobey, but it's your choice. You have to make a decision. And if you, if you follow God, life, life always, I mean, this is everyday life. Life is about decisions. And it's about consequences. You can obey or disobey. Both have consequences. A church should understand that. Uh, Having a relationship with God, having the light on is, is about decisions. Every time God speaks, whether it's an admissions conference or, or a pastor is speaking or a guest speaker is speaking or a, or a Sunday school teacher is teaching or, or you're opening your Bible, every time the light is, is being turned on, God is speaking. And you have to make a choice. You have to decide. Do I obey or do I disobey? Two choices. You have to decide. If I obey, there's a consequence. If I disobey, there is, there's a consequence. So the light's on. The light's been, it's been set really, really, really clearly on. Uh, Second Chronicles 36, because the last few days, the light's been, the light's been on. God has spoken very clearly. And that's a constant in the Word of God. You know, He's always speaking clearly. One of the things we cannot say, and I'm going to say this about this church, because I've been coming to this church for a long, long time. And one thing I can say about this, maybe some other churches, maybe some other churches, maybe some other place on earth, maybe some other, you know, culture, maybe some other area, but I'm going to say something about this church particularly. This church can never say, oh, we don't know what God is saying. Never. Never, ever. Never. God speaks clearly. Really clearly. And He's done it through the years. And that's a constant in the Word of God. That was a constant with the people of Israel. Because God speaking is never the problem. The problem is the people obeying. That, that's always the problem. Uh, in, in, in the case of Israel, when, when you, if you follow the, the, the history of Israel, you're going to find that when you get to the, the, the end of Chronicles, right before they go into captivity, and, and all the mess they went into captivity, it says in 2 Chronicles 36, 15, it says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising, rising up beat times and send them. He says, repeatedly. That's what it says, repeatedly. Because he had compassion on his people. He was speaking to them over and over and on his dwelling place. He says, over and over and over. Once again and again and again and again and again. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen. Uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 21, 8, he says, once again, it's like, like what he's saying here, uh, the, 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 the blessing and the curse. You, you, you either obey or you disobey. The, the light is on, but you have to make a decision. You have to make up your mind. He says in Jeremiah 21, 8, and unto the people 
Unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. So the light is on. And God lets us choose. The problem is that he lets us pay our consequences. There was a guy in our church. He's with the Lord now. But one day he came to my office. And he said, he told me, he told me a line, one of those lines that are hard to forget. He says, he said, the problem with some people, he said, is that they think life is like a teenage movie. And I said, what do you mean? Yeah, like a teenage movie. And I said, what is that? Well, you know, you, you've seen teenage movies. And I said, uh, yeah, what do you mean? Well, you know, in teenage movies, they never rehearse, but when it's the right time, they all dance in synchrony, you know, <laughs> perfectly. Yes. They never, they never uh, train, but they all win the competition. And they never, you know, and, and, I, and they, he started saying a lot of stuff like that. And I thought, that's so true. That's so true. But life is not like that. If you don't rehearse, you know what happens if you don't rehearse? You know what happens if you don't rehearse? You, you never win. Because life is about making choices and paying your consequences. That's the way it works. Life is not a teenage movie. So God lets us live in a way, in a life, where we pay our consequences. We don't obey. We pay our consequences. And he says, I sent you my, my light. I sent you my messengers, my messages, messengers over and over and over. And you will listen. You know what it says, the, the, the following verse in, in Second Chronicles? But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people and there was no remedy. Because when the light is on, he allows us to make decisions. But he lets us pay the consequences. Yeah. Deuteronomy gives us a very simple, simple principle. God truth is of very little use if it doesn't help you make concrete decisions that lead to radical change. So it's time for this church to make decisions. The light is on so we can make decisions. Should we make decisions as a corporate church? I believe so. And it's time for individuals to make decisions. It's time for you to make decisions. The light is on. You need to make decisions. Well, what does that mean? Okay, let, me, let me play a riddle with you on that. Uh, we've been talking about bunkers and, and wheels. Let me use one more illustration here. There are three frogs on a branch. Have you ever heard this? Okay. Three frogs on a branch. 
one of the frogs decides to jump. How many frogs do we have now on the branch? You, you look so perplexed <laughs> that I'm going to put the frogs up there. <laughs> okay. There are three frogs on a branch. Which frog do you think looks like decided to, to jump? <laughs> three frogs on a branch. One of them decides to jump. How many are left on the branch? Two, three. They're, they're like... You know, if there are three frogs on a branch, and one of them decides to jump. They have, you guys have like a, huh? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you 10 minutes to decide. Uh, <laughs> If you have three frogs on a, on a branch, and one of them decides to, to jump, you still have three frogs on the, jump, on, the, on the branch. Because deciding doesn't mean jumping. That's the problem. A lot of people make decisions, and that's where it all stops. That's the problem with a lot of Christians. You make a lot of decisions. We make a lot of decisions. And that's where it all stops. That's why Deuteronomy goes, goes on down. He says there is the, the blessing and the curse. You got to make up your mind. You know, you have to make a decision. I've given you the light. You have to decide. You decide for the blessing or you decide for the curse. And, and you know, if you, it, I, I mean, if I was there, I would have said immediately. I mean, it doesn't take much. I would have said immediately, I go for the blessing. I mean, who, who in his right mind, I, I mean, who in his right mind would say, who, who in his right mind would say, hey, hey, how about going for the curse? <laughs> Who would say that? I mean, really, really. I, I don't know anybody. I mean, it would take, it, it would take, I mean, you would have to be dumb. <laughs> don't be dumb. That's why God says something else. He said, you have the blessing, you have the curse. You have to decide. But you're going to go into the land. And when you go into the land, you have to make sure that you act upon it. So the second principle is very, very, very easy. The second principle is you have to take action. You have to make decisions. And you have to take action. And he says, verse, verse 20, 29, It shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God has brought thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Jerusalem, and the curse about, upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side, Jordan? By the way, there the sun goes down in the land of the Canaanites, which dealt in the uh, champaign over against Gilgal before, beside the plains of Mori. For ye shall pass over Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And look at verse 32. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes of judgment which I set before you this day. So you decided, you decided, you, you decided you were going to do it. Yes, yes, you decided. But now, those decisions have to come to the point where you actually make them. 
Decisions that do not translate into concrete actions remain simple, good intentions. And they're not good at all. It's sad. It says in verse 32, and I'll put it up here because I want to just make a note to you. You shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. Just do it, he says. Just do it. Very Nike. <laughs> you know those, the, those words? Those two words? It says, observe. That's a Hebrew word that means put up a security fence. Do anything and everything you need to do to make sure that you put this into practice. Because making a decision is not enough. Have you ever tried to lose weight? Do you ever try to, do you ever make the decision that you were going to lose weight? There's a, there's a big difference between making a decision and going, and you know, and actually losing weight or anything else, learning a language, finishing college. Or be in the church that God wants you to be. There's a big decision, big, big, big gap. A blessing and a curse. Decisions and actions. It's everywhere. Deuteronomy 12.32. That was Deuteronomy 11.32. 12.32 says, What things soever I command you, Observe to do it. It doesn't say observe to talk about it. Learn it. Learn it by heart. Preach about it. Sing about it. Memorize it. And I'm, I'm all for memorizing it. But that's not the commandment. You got to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, 14. But the word is very nigh unto thee. I, I'm, I'm giving you the light in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou, thou may do it. Just do it. So it's no longer about spiritual principles, but about the implementation of these principles. God has turned the light on. So I'm closing tonight. I'm closing. And I got a few questions here. What is the biggest impediment for this church to be like the church of Antioch? And I'm not saying who. What? What is the biggest impediment? This church has to decide what is the biggest impediment and take actions about it because the light is on. Is it fear? Is it lack of faith? I, I was listening to Maddox a while ago. I was challenged by him. Is it focus? What is it? What action should we take to remove that impediment? When are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Because all, you, you know what I'm saying. Otherwise, otherwise, a time like this will be a great memory. And it's not worth it.
not worth it. Have we lost our first love as a church? Is that what it is? What action should we take to regain that first law? Have we forgotten our fear of God? Have we lost our sense of awe? And if that's the problem, what are we going to do about that? Actions. Is there something in my life, personally, me, as a church member, as a leader, l leaders, leaders, is there something in my life as a leader, o or you as a parent, is, is there a sin That is stopping the advancement of God's kingdom. If, if there is, we need to take action. We need to consider repenting, confessing, making restitution, changing directions. But you know how it is. The light is on. We could become a church like Antioch. Or we, we could not. Is the blessing or the curse? Is decisions and actions. A missions conference is an excellent time for God. To turn on his light on for us. And I think he's, he's turned his light on, on, on one area. One area. But we need to react. And we always have to react. And, and this is a principle for everything. I hope, I hope you keep those two principles for next Sunday. Bring those two principles next, next Sunday. Decisions and actions. Because that's why we, sh we should react. Every time the light is on, deci decisions and actions. Because that's what, the, that's what God is all about. Let's pray. Do you want to pray? Father.